Hi everyone, welcome. This is the fourth talk in our series. You should all know me by now, uh, Rebecca, the B Biosecurity Officer for Queensland. Tonight we're also joined by Kelly and Susie who are helping us out again with the technical and logistical side of things. And we've got Hamish Lamb, one of our APIA officers, who is going to help us out with the questions. So before we start tonight, I'm just going to quickly step you through, as a reminder, those key steps for good B biosecurity. So if you remember, they're ensuring you register as a, as a RBE and mark your hives with the HIN number that we send out. Practice good B husbandry. Check your hives regularly for pests and diseases. Report any notifiable pests and diseases, and that's what we're going to uh, focus on tonight. Only buy or use equipment that you know has come from a clean source or radiate it before you use it. Instigate a barrier system, particularly if you have quite a few hives, and practice that go clean, come clean practice to make sure you're not spreading other pests and diseases. So what's tonight's talk on? Tonight we're going to be talking about submitting samples for disease testing. So why would we want to be sending testing for uh, samples for testing? There's two main reasons. The first one is disease testing. And this is where we've got a strong suspicion that you have a disease that may pose a biosecurity risk. So that's one of those notifiable diseases. It could also be that you have something that's very obviously wrong with your hive, but you're not quite sure what it is. You can't pinpoint it. You might also send um, samples off for routine testing. And this includes your yearly honey tests for AFB. You might be doing this to be uh, compliant with the Australian Honeybee Industry Practice uh, Biosecurity Code of Practice, which is really important that we keep um, uh, in line with that code. Or you might be ensuring that your hive is disease free before you sell it or move it, which is also really key. If you're sell um, selling a hive, that guarantee that it's coming without uh, particular diseases can be really a, a good thing for both the person buying it and for you as a seller. So let's talk first about disease testing and what you need to do um, to go through the different steps for uh, the disease testing. And the first thing you want to do is to try and diagnose the problem as best you can yourself. So see if you know um, what it might be. You might want to go back over the talk we had on brood diseases and on mites and see if you can pick up any of those symptoms. Of course, there's those fantastic resources in the Bee Biosecurity Manual and on the Bee web website where you can look at all the photos and images of the different pests and diseases and the descriptions. And that might help you to diagnose it. Things like uh, chalk brood, sack brood and acema. There's a good chance if you uh, go and have a bit of a go, you'll probably be able to diagnose some of these yourself. But if not, next point of call is to see if you can talk to a local beekeeper who's more experienced or a really great point uh, place to go to is your local beekeeping club and see if they can have a, uh, take a look at it for you and, and see what they think. And these uh, more experienced beekeepers might be able to point you in the right direction. Of course, as a beekeeper, as you get more experienced yourself, you are probably kind of get a feel for these symptoms and, and signs as you see them. The next step is to determine what kind of sample you're going to need to take and we're going to talk about that in a bit more detail as well as taking the sample. Once you've taken your sample there's some paperwork you'll need to fill out and then you send your sample off to the biosecurity sciences laboratory. The final step is you're going to get some feedback about your test and how well it went so you get an email and I will give you a call and uh, let you know, check that you got the advice um, from the lab about what it is and see if you need any assistance or advice on how to manage the pest and disease that you have. So the type of sampling method you, just, you decide to use will depend on the disease you suspect, the kind of thing that you think is going wrong. So if you think it's a brood disease and we talked uh, two talks about uh, ago about brood diseases, and those include things like AFB, EFB, chalk brood, and sack brood. Those all fall into the brood disease category, and there's two different types of samples you can do for this. You can do a brood sample or a matchstick test, and I'll tell you a little bit uh, more about those in a minute. You might also uh, need to do an adult bee disease test, and this is for diseases that affect mostly adults. So these are things like mesema um, and some of the viruses that affect adult bees. And for this, you'll need sick or recently dead bees. And finally, you might be testing 
um, or sampling for external parasites. So we talked a lot about this last week. So these are your mites, Varroa uh, and Tropolalaps mites, as well as Brawler fly. And for this, you're going to want the filter paper from your alcohol wash or sugar shake. So let's talk about these in a bit more detail. For our brew diseases, there were two different options, a brood sample or a matchstick test. Now for your brood sample, you get one of your frames out of your brood box where your baby bees are in the bottom, and you wanna cut out a piece of that uh, brood. So about what, 10 centimeters by 10 centimeter square piece, and use a, a, a knife, sometimes a, a warm knife can help to cut through a bit more smoothly. Now, once you've cut that bit out, and the bit you want is a piece that looks like it's showing the disease symptoms that you're worried about. So don't pick a good healthy piece, pick a really sick disease looking piece. Wrap that piece up into newspaper. Then you wanna complete your submission form and send your sample away. If you've got a, a, a matchstick sample and you might take a brood uh, sample, a cut it a square out, if you think maybe you know, you need a few extra samples in there. But, uh, some of the cells are, are quite different. You want to uh, show an, a range of different components that's going on in your hive. You, you might do uh, a brood sample. Or um, if you're not, if you've got a whole bunch of the disease in the one place, it's really good to do a brood sample because you can send it all in. If it's scattered throughout your hive, you've just got a cell here and a cell there that is showing disease samples, then you might want to go for a match six sample. And uh, AFB is really a typical one where you'd often send in a match six sample. So it's great for if you suspect AFB or EFB, American or European fowl brood. So what you want to do for a brood, uh, so, sorry, for a match six sample is to get your little match stick, get the non-striking end and poke it into the cell coat it as much as you can with that goo that's in the cell from disease, for many that are sort of suspect disease cells. And if you want to do it in a couple, that's okay. Do a couple of cells. Very much like what you do for when you're trying to diagnose the disease. Get as much goo as you can on that matchstick and then put it into a sealed plastic container like you can see at the bottom. And on that container, you want to write some of your details. So you want to put in your name, what disease you suspect, if you know what it is, the date you collected the sample, as well as your phone number. Now, I find the best thing to write on these types of plastic containers with is a Sharpie, it's a good pen, um, and let it dry a little bit first so it doesn't smudge when you put it in the bag. Then you want to place uh, that sample in a Ziploc container and fill in your completed submission form before you send it in. Now, for adult bee diseases, you're going to want to collect at least 60 if you can, sick or uh, recently dead bees from the hive entrance. Now we don't want to collect them from the brood box inside the hive and that's because the ones in there tend to be nurse bees, they might be quite a bit younger and they may not have built up the level of disease yet that our, our older worker bees that are going out and foraging have. So if we can collect them from the entrance of the hive, these are the bees that are coming in and out and that will mean that we've got a better chance of picking up on the, on the pest or disease. So place those bees in a sealed jar and then just cover them with a methylated spirit. So you have to fill the whole jar up just enough so that it's covering the bees all the way up. Then again, label your jar with your name, what you suspect the disease is, the date you collected it and your phone number and place that jar in a Ziploc bag. And in that Ziploc bag, you wanna add something a little bit absorbent just in case you get any leakage. So a bit of paper towel or something like that. And that stops it leaking all through the mail and leaking onto your uh, sample submission form and then making it unreadable. Fill out your sample submission form and you can place all of that again inside another Ziploc bag. Or if you're going to drop it off in person, you can put it in a little esky. So for our external parasites, this is after we've done an alcohol wash or a sugar shake. We wanna pour that liquid. So if it's an alcohol wash, it'll be the methylated spirits, or if it's a sugar shake, it'll be water that contains our little suspect insects through that filter paper. And then once it's all been filtered through, fold it uh, in half and then a hand half again. So it's in quarters and make sure that anything that you poured through 
So anywhere, anything where your mites might be is in the centre, folded up in the middle, not folded outwards. Place that one again in a Ziploc bag and this time name that puts your details on the bag. So your name, your suspect pest, date and phone number. Again, complete your submission form, chuck it all in another Ziploc bag and it's ready to send. Uh, it, it's ready. But I will say here, this is the one that you don't want to be sending off. So just hold on for, onto it and give us a call and we're going to uh, want to come and probably collect that in person and maybe even take some more samples. So this is the one uh, test that you wouldn't be sending away, hold on to it and give us a call. So we've talked about disease testing. Now I'm going to talk a bit about routine testing, which is health uh, testing, hive testing. So for this, it's uh, you want to do when you are wanting to either do a yearly routine honey test to comply with the code, or again, if you wanted to sell your hive or move your hive and you want to make sure it's, it's free from diseases. So start with a clean jar, quite a large jar, because we want to collect at least 100 mils of honey. And that 100 mils of honey needs to come from at least 20% of your hive. So the more the better, but if it can be at least 20%, then it represents your apiary as a whole. So it gives us a better idea of what we're seeing across the board. If you're just concerned about a single hive, one hive that you want to sell or move, then you can um, just send from one hive. But if you're doing your yearly disease testing for AFB, it needs to be from at least that 20% of your hives. Take the honey after it's extracted, so it's all kind of mixed in together, and it should be free from any wax or debris. So don't put honeycomb in there. It does need to be extracted honey. Put your honey in a, in a sealed plastic jar, and again, label your jar, so your name, date, and your phone number, of course, in that one. You don't need to put the disease test in there because we know what, what it should be if we've got a honey sample. Place your jar again in a Ziploc bag with something absorbent, just in case we get any leaks, and finish your submission form and put it all in that Ziploc bag and send off. So I've talked about for all of these testing, making sure you uh, fill out your paperwork, your submission form. And let's talk a bit more about this in detail because it's a bit of a complicated form. So the form that needs to go in with every lot of samples is the specimen advice sheet form A. Now this uh, form you can find both on our website. Um, I'm also gonna put it up in the link um, at the end in the question and answers. Or of course you can give me an email and I send me an email and I will or a phone call and I'll send one out to you, email one out to you. And it's really important that this gets filled in accurately because otherwise we won't be able to process your sample effectively. Now you only need one of these these forms for each set of samples you send in, but every time you send in samples, you need one. So each sort of mail package that you're going to post in, you need a new one, but you don't need a new one for every single sample that's in that package. So let's go through in a bit of detail. Start at the top of the form and what you need to include here is information about the person who's submitting the sample. So if that's you, you check the hive and you think, oh, there's a problem, that then your name goes in there. You may or may not have a company name. We also want your, con uh, your contact details, so your address and your phone number. Now, it's important that we have those so that we can get onto you. Your phone number is really essential because I'm going to be calling you to ensure that you have all the information you need to manage the pest or disease once we've got it diagnosed. And your email is also really important because the results of your lab test will be emailed out to you. And so we can't do this unless we've got an email address for you. The next section uh, to fill out is information about the animal or the owner. So if the hive isn't yours, if you're managing it for someone else, then this is the place that you put in the owner's name. If it's you, then put your, same, your name in again. Now, while the section above asks for your contact details, what we're interested in here is the details of where the hive is. So where we think the suspected disease is. So the property number, if, if it's on a property or the name of the property, if it's on a property, if not your address. So this could be the same as your residential address if you've just got your hive in your backyard, but often for beekeepers it's not, particularly commercial beekeepers who might have their hives way off 
um, hundreds or thousands of kilometres from their home. But even hobbyist beekeepers sometimes keep their hives somewhere slightly different to where they live. And it's important that we know this because we're interested in both being able to contact you, but also to know where this outbreak is so we can have a better idea of how the disease is moving around the state. The next section down is talking about um, the current outbreak. And so what we need to put in here is the number of hives on the property is the first section. So the number on property would be, let's say you have 10 hives. The number of those that are sick, so how many of your hives are showing symptoms? You might only have three of those 10 hives that are showing symptoms. Then it's asking for what treatments are under being undertaken in your hive. And so really the main one here you might be doing is some antibiotics for EFB. So list anything there that you're treating your hive with. The vaccination bit isn't for bees. Unfortunately, we don't have any good vaccines for bees yet. The date of the onset is when you first notice the symptoms. Now, this might be the same date as when you collected the sample, but it could be that you started to see symptoms the last time you checked your hive. So if that's the case, put that date in here rather than the date you've collected your samples. The number in, um, in the at-risk group here refers to how many hives you think could be infected. Let's say if we had our 10 hives on our property, five were on one side of the property and the other five were on the other. And those two different groups of five, you use very different equipment and all different clothing and you treated them very separately. I would say the one um, set of five where you saw three hives that had a disease in it, all, all five would likely to be at risk whereas the other five that you treat very differently like must, much less likely to be at risk. So have a bit of a think of how many hives are close to each other or you share equipment with that would mean that you might have a whole number of hives that are in that at risk group. And the final one is the number that are deceased and for our hives um, hopefully you'll catch them before they will um, uh, so they all leave the hive and the hive will be dead. But you may find that then when you come to check your hives, you might have a group of hives and a couple of them are sick and a couple of them are already um, succumbed. And so if you're pretty sure that you think it's the same pest or, or disease, you can put how many have succumbed to it already. Moving on to the right hand side here, the section on uh, the type of animal. Of course, our type of animal here is bees and our breed slash species is European bees. So we don't really do any testing on native bees and our lab isn't really um, um, equipped for, for doing that sort of testing. We've really focused on European bees. So unfortunately, we can't really accept those samples from um, uh, our native bees. And for bees, um, the next two questions, sex and status, just put NA because it doesn't really apply for bees. And on the far right hand side, it's asking you about the production and husbandry. And again, a bit tricky for bees, but where it says production type, uh, tick other and write honey. And husbandry type, tick other and write bees. And the final bit asks you about related previous jobs. So the only time you put something in this section is if you'd already sent a sample away to that lab and that sample um, wasn't sufficient that we could determine what the disease was and we've asked you to take another sample, then you write that in here. So that's the only time you need to include that related previous jobs bit. Now let's go on to the next section, which is completing the history and clinical signs. And this is essential for us to try and figure out what kind of tests we should be doing for these uh, disease samples you've sent in. So you need to put in the history and clinical signs. So write down all the symptoms that you've had and when you notice them and why you sort of why you suspect a disease. So let's just go through a bit of a, an example. Let's say we've opened a hive and we found that the cell caps are sunken. It has a sour kind of odour, kind of foul. We also noticed that some of the cell caps had holes in them. And when we did a matchstick test, we got a thick gooey caramel. So all of those things you would write in there as being your clinical signs or symptoms. And then the next section, the disease suspected. For this one, we'd suspect AFB or EFB. It could be either. And in the final section, you put in the test that you requested. Now you can leave this blank if you're not sure. You don't know what disease you suspect. 
don't worry too much, you can just leave that blank. But if you do know, you can say, okay, I wanna test for AFB and EFB. Now, another important bit to remember to fill in is the reason for the test. And for beekeepers, there's only really two options you should be choosing here, although there are other options available. And these are the disease investigation. If you suspect that you have a notifiable disease due to the symptoms you've outlined in that clinical science that we just did above, you would tick that one. If uh, you're requesting a routine test, either to conform to the code of practice or you're selling or moving your hive and you just wanna check that your hive's healthy, then you tick the one for health test. So it's important to know the difference and tick the right box here because it does have implications for how um, we deal with the test and also it has implications for whether or not you're charged for the test. So uh, getting to the end of the, the form now, the next section is a little bit of uh, kind of notes and this is to help you to figure out if you've sent multiple samples, which samples which and which one you're referring to. So you can put in notes here about what type of sample you took. So say we took two samples, we took a brood sample from our first hive, hive number one, and a matchstick sample from hive number two. So that's both so the, so the diagnostician can figure out which is which and know which sample um, came from which hive. And also when it comes back to you, you know which of the samples you sent in came from which hive. Finally, last little bit, don't forget to sign and date the form at the bottom. Now I know this form it can be a little complicated. Um, hopefully that um, going through it tonight has given you a bit of insight into what goes in each bit. But if you're having any difficulty filling it out, please don't hesitate to give me a call and I'll walk, walk walk you through it, get you through to the end. So I mentioned before about the costs of sending a sample in and it depends what you're sending the sample in for. So if you tick that disease testing box and you tick that because you suspect that you have a notifiable disease and you've listed all the symptoms and those are congruent with having a, a notifiable disease, then the test is fully subsidized by Biosecurity Queensland and you don't need to pay for that test. If on the other hand, you're doing a health check, and so this is a routine test, you don't suspect a notifiable disease or the symptoms don't match a notifiable disease, you just wanna check your hive is nice and healthy. Then if you're sending in a brood uh, disease sample, it's $30.72 at the moment, and for an AFB honey sample, it's $29.10. Now that might change over time, so please uh, continue to check back on that but that's what uh, the cost of it at the moment is. So what kinds of testing do we he do here in Queensland? At the Biosecurity Sciences Lab at Coopers Plains, they test for AFB and EFB, so American fowl brood and European fowl brood. They also test for chalk brood and Nacima. And at the Ecosciences Precinct at Bogger Road, where I work most of the time when I'm not working from home, our entomologists uh, diagnose uh, Varroa and triple lapse mites. Now, if you have something that's outside of this and we do the test and we find, okay, that's not quite what it is, but we still think there's something wrong, then we can send the uh, samples into the state. And that does sometimes happen. We might send them to New South Wales or Victoria, where they do a, a different range of testing. And so that can be one way that we can um, figure it out what's going wrong if it's not one of these most common pests or diseases. So we've got all our samples together, we've got our form, it's all filled out, where do we send our sample? Well you want to send your sample in as soon as you can after you've taken it, so don't let it sit in the shed for a week and then send it, send it very quickly because otherwise the disease might break down and we might not be able to um, sample it very well. But it's okay if it does take a day or two to get to us. So to send your sample in, uh, you send them to the set specimens receipt loading dock 12 at the Biosecurity Science Lab and that's out at Cooper's Plain. So the address is here and our address of course is also on the website and you can always email me for it. That's ex everything except um, mites or those external parasites. Those ones don't send them in of course, give us a ring, call uh, the DAP hotline and we will be able to give you instructions about what to do next. And most likely we'll be there quick smart to um, have a look at those mines. So lots of people ask me, 
what actually goes on in the lab. Now, unfortunately, I couldn't um, get anyone tonight uh, to help me out to talk about that from the lab, but I did get some notes from them about what they do in terms of disease testing. And of course, what goes on depends on what the sample is and what the disease is. So let's talk about just a few of the really common ones. So for AFB, American fowl brood, and EFB, European fowl brood, when the samples come in, we take a little bit of it, and then it's stained, so it's coloured, and we look at it under the microscope. So it's really quite that simple. And we're looking for specific characteristics of the cells themselves, bacterial cells themselves, which allow us to determine which disease it is. Similarly, for chalk brood, you can, oh, actually, let's just back up a little bit because the other question that people often ask me is, how is the testing you do in the lab different from my home testing kit? And it's quite a different test. So while we're looking for the actual organism in the lab that's causing the disease, your home testing kits are testing for the antibodies that the bees have produced against those organisms. And so what you might find is that the, the difference is in order for the disease to be um, shown up in those home testing kits, your bees have had, had them a little while and they have to have been infected and long enough that they produce some antibodies. So there's a little bit of a difference between those two tests. Chalk brew uh, is very similar to AFB and EFB. We take a little sample of what you've sent in and we have a look at it under the microscope. And you can see in the photo here, the spores from chalk brood are very distinctive. They come in a, a round uh, a, a spore case and inside that spore case are very round little spores, whereas you can see for the AFB and EFB ones, they're kind of elongated. Now the test for Nocema, which is another common disease, is quite different from these. These ones are microscopic tests where we're just looking at the organism. The one for Nocema is a DNA test. So when your sample comes in with your dead bees um, in your methylated spirits, we take the bees out, we take off their abdomens and we ground them up into a little bit of a sort of a paste. And from that paste, we extract that DNA out and we can then run a test and see if the DNA for Nosema is in that sample. So we can match up what it should look like if we saw the DNA for Nosema with a, a sample that has Nosema um, against our B samples to see if any of them have it in there. So it's a very different test for Nosema. Now, for, um, for other samples that are sent in, if they're mites or if they're um, ex other external parasites, they're looked at underneath the microscope by our uh, entomologists at ESP. And what they're doing is they're looking for very specific characteristics of each insect, and they'll match that both to the description as well as in our insect collection, we'll have some examples of that insect, as well as examples of very similar insects so that we can match them against that and make sure we've got the right one. And most likely we'll also do a DNA test to get a bit more information about that pest. And that will also often give us some information too about where it might've come from or originated. So what happens next? You have sent your sample away, the lab's working on it very, very, um, busily and you're waiting uh, for uh, your test to come back. While you're waiting, don't use any of your equipment on other hives or move your hive. That increases your risk that you might spread that pest or disease and so you don't want to do that. Try and keep everything together. Um, I have a big plastic tub that I keep all my beekeeping tools and my um, beekeeping suit and everything in. And so I always make sure it goes back in that and it's sealed up so that bees can't get in it. Now, depending on the backlog we have in the lab and what kind of tests you uh, need to have done, you should receive an email notification with your test results within a week. Sometimes it's much sooner than that if we haven't got a heap of samples in at the lab. And so once you've got that result, it'll also get sent through to me and hopefully you'll have your phone number on that form, which will allow me to give you a quick call and just check with you that you know what you've got the result, you know what's going on. Um, if you want to ask for any advice, I can walk you through how to manage that pest or disease, give you some hints and tips. And um, hopefully from there, you can go on and, and get rid of the pest um, from your hives. 
So that's about all we have for tonight. Um, time for some questions. But I'm also currently thinking about what might go into our next talk series. So if you have some suggestions about B biosecurity topics that you'd like me to talk about, and I've already had some suggestions, uh, people requesting some very common pests like ants and wax moth and small hive beetles. So I'll definitely have that one in there. But if you have other suggestions, I'd love to hear them. You can put them in the Q&A or you can send me through an email, give me a call and, and tell me what they are. And that will help me uh, figure out what the best things to cover in upcoming talks will be. And I'll let you know next week at our last talk in this series, what the next series will look like and when that one will start. Okay, so let's pull up the questions for tonight. We've got a bunch here already. Okay, so first question um, I've got here is from Jen, and she's asking, do, do backyard beekeepers, if she only has two hives, have to do honey sampling? She actively manages disease, um, does inspections and preventions, but didn't realize about the honey test requirements. So um, the code of practice only requires honeybees who have, uh, sorry, beekeepers who have over 50 hives to do that yearly test. So it's not a requirement. It's more of your own peace of mind if you're not sure, if you want to have a go and, and you know, continue to uh, monitor your hives in that way. But if you kind of know what you're doing and you've only got a couple of hives, you don't necessarily have to do that regular honey testing every year. Okay, next question is uh, from Evan. Uh, he's asking if you wanted to replace, oh, sorry, let me read it. How long will our honey um, uh, test take if you want to get a health check? Again, it should take about the same amount of time as our other tests. So a health check should only take um, less than a week to come through to you. Okay, I've got another question here um, and I'll answer this one as well. The form for submission is very complicated, particularly for the un annual honey test. Could this not be simplified? I'm really sorry guys, I have actually had a bit of a chat to the guys in the lab about this and unfortunately because they need just one form for everything, um, it is complicated and that's kind of why I wanted to talk you through it tonight to try and make sure everyone had a grasp of this. Um, I'm hoping maybe in the future we might be able to do something to change that, but at the moment that's unfortunately the form that we're stuck with. Um, I'm going to toss this one over to you Hamish, it's from Shane and he's asking is there a fee for the annual honey test or is this considered disease investigation? Yeah, thanks yeah, Rebecca. Thanks, Rebecca. Um, Shane, the situation there is um, it, uh, all the honey tests are a fee. There is a fee involved for them and it's around $50. So um, unfortunately that's, um, that's the deal with, with honey testing uh, across the board, I believe. Thanks Hamish. Yep, unfortunately those regular honey tests do cost a fee. Um, interesting question here from Jen. Uh, do you know where or how we can get honey tested for its health properties? Um, like some of the times you see these types of things on TV. I actually am not sure. I know there was some uh, scientists out of uh, South Australia, I think, who were doing some uh, testing on Australian honey for those health properties. But Hamish, do you have any idea, um, anyone who does that regularly? Yeah, thanks, Rebecca. Um, yeah, it's, um, uh, we might have to take that one on notice, but um, just, around that there are a lot of research laboratories doing um, testing on honey for their medicinal properties etc. Um, if that's what you're after and depending on where Jen is, uh, the Sunshine Coast University uh, are doing work on that and perhaps best communicate with them but um, perhaps we can get back to Jen on um, a more wider uh, testing um, availability I suppose. Yeah. Thanks Hamish. Yeah, I, th I think um, test, this type of testing is actually fairly new to, to Australia and we haven't been doing it all that much and that might be why there's probably not a whole lot out there at the moment. 
Now I've got a question here from Lindsay and he's asking, would chemical treatments be recommended for diagnosis of disease like EFB on eczema? And this is a, a quite a good question and it's important that we talk about this one because you really need to diagnose first before you do any treatment, particularly for something like EFB because it can be very easily confused with AFB. And if you start treating a hive like it has EFB and giving it some antibiotics, it may seem for a little while like those antibiotics are working, but the problem is if it's AFB, it'll have those very resistant spores. And as soon as you stop giving that hive antibiotics, it's going to go back in full force the disease again and it'll take down your hive and while you're still treating it with that antibiotics it's going to continue to spread to your other hives so it's really important that you first get a good diagnosis and if that means sending a sample into us or talking to a, an experienced beekeeper either of those are a great avenue before you then go on and do any treatment so make sure you do know what it is because just using different various treatments tends to not be particularly effective. One of the things you can do if you don't think it's something serious, you don't think it's AFB, um, but you just think something's a bit off, is to improve all of those good bee husbandry practices that we've been talking about. So you might need to provide some food for your hive, you might need to requeen, you might need to think about how much honey stores you're leaving for that hive over the winter and all those types of things. And that can then boost your hive back up without actually having to, to make that diagnosis. So if you think it could be chalk brood or it could be sac brood, then that's a good strategy. But if you think it could possibly be something more serious like AFB, you really need to get it tested. Okay, here's one, I'll throw this one to uh, Hamish. Uh, it's a question from Shane. Um, if you have bees at multiple sites, do you need to send in separate annual honey samples? Yeah, thanks Rebecca. Um, with this one, um, I guess it just, it comes down to how much money you want to spend in that, um, I mean, you've got to consider that, uh, you know, you're paying $50 for a honey test. So uh, that's one, one consideration. But generally the honey test is designed to sample a whole lot of hives, a whole lot of your hives, to find out if it has AFB or not. And from that, um, then you go looking in the hives uh, for AFB uh, in a brood brood inspection. So that's sort of the, the spirit of the, the honey testing process. So if you had a dozen hives at each site, well, perhaps you do two honey tests. But, um, and it also is, uh, I guess, an informed decision whether you um, suspect something at one of those sites. Personally, I would um, combine both sites with a honey test and then go from there unless you suspect that you're in a, um, an AFB area perhaps and you think no I'll just get each site sampled um, separately um, and then you know it is a case of just how many hives you have at those sites to how much you want to invest in them so uh, I hope that answers it in some way. Thanks Hamish. So next question here um, from Kathy is can samples be and completed forms be delivered uh, in person to the lab and you can um, take them in in person to the Cooper's Plains lab so it's to that loading dock 12. As long as you've got all that paperwork and it's all in a container together um, then that's fine. Um, to ESP you really need an EcoScience precinct. Um, unlikely you'll need to send anything there. Um, we might give you instructions for that but if that happens we will um, tell you how to do that over the phone. Um, Great, great uh, comment here from Jason. It would be great to complete the form online, um, then print it out um, and include some help instructions. Um, and so I am definitely uh, working at the moment on a little uh, help or guide to lead you through what you should be putting in each of those sections. So keep your eyes open for that. It'll come out in a fact sheet form um, and it'll all be about sending samples to the lab. So it'll include both how to take the samples like we've talked about tonight, but also how to fill in that form. So thanks, Jason, great suggestion. And he's also included some information here about different places that are doing some honey testing. So uh, Sunshine Coast University, so there, um, anyone who's keen to do that. 
I'm going to throw this next question to you, Hamish, because I'm not sure about the answer. Um, the uh, question is, what is the minimum age of your honey for a honey test? Oh, thanks, Rebecca. Um, I'm, perhaps I'm not sure what the meaning of that is, but, um, but basically, um, honey that's ready for extraction is is sort of what we're getting at to um, to do the honey test. Um, I, I'm not sure if the question is around whether the honey being unripened or just fresh nectar. I'm not sure, but um, it's the, the capped uh, honey that uh, you're extracting is is what we're after for um, for honey uh, for AFB testing. Yeah. Yeah. OK, thanks, Hamish. Yeah, it's it's, it's um, bit of an ambiguous. If, if we haven't quite answered your question, Tom, uh, please uh, send us another note and we'll have another crack at that. Um, at the moment, I think we've uh, run through all the questions. Oh wait, no, we haven't. There's <laughs> more there. Okay. Where would you send samples for pesticide testing? Um, and so you can send those into DAF, I am thinking. Hamish, is that true? Yes, uh, yes, Rebecca, with the pesticide testing, it's probably best um, uh, deepening the, the initial investigation in, with a conversation with the um, you know, APRI office or, or yourself, Rebecca, just to, um, to get it right, because um, that one's a bit of a complicated one uh, legislatively. So um, we need to know a few more things around it rather than just sending a, um, a number of bees in. But yes, it can be tested within um, the department, uh, but I suggest and advise um, some communication to an APRI officer first because there are some um, steps involved in um, in sample collection and also um, evidence gathering if it turns out to be um, uh, something that goes to litigation. Yep. Thanks, Hamish. That's a really important point. And with any of the tests, if you're not sure, please do give us a call. Um, we've given you some details about how to do it tonight, but um, you know, it, it is a complicated process and, and we'll, I'm definitely more, more than happy to help you out with it step by step if, if you need any assistance. Another great comment here from Jason, um, and I will bring this up with our lab people, is including a QR code to make it uh, quicker to process our form online. So great suggestion. Thanks, Jason. So I think we've come to the end of our questions for tonight. Remember, if you've got any suggestions for upcoming uh, talks in the next talk series, I would absolutely love to hear them. And we've also got next week, um, sorry, two weeks time, uh, we've got our final talk in this series, which is on the B Biosecurity Code of Practice. And I've got a special guest from QBA coming along to help us answer any of those questions about the Code of Practice. And so, uh, the Code of Practice is coming in in many states and legislation very, very soon. So if you do take your bees into state, it's even more important that you have a good understanding of the Code of Practice and how it applies to you. So uh, join us next week and thank you everyone.